Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He has his finger on the pulse of financings for the gold, silver, and copper mining industries. A lot of deals come across his desk, and the company that he runs, that he co-founded, president and CEO of, they have such an extensive due diligence process that he turns most of them down. So Nolan Watson, CEO of Sandstorm Gold, thank you for joining me again. Well, thanks very much for having me. So Nolan, before we talk about the state of the gold mining industry and it's crazy with the coronavirus, it's changing every day. I just saw your Kitco interview that came out, the audio one that came out uh, yesterday, and then you had your written Kitco interview that was summarized last week. So it's constantly changing, it's a moving target. But before we talk about that, let's get your opinion on the last five or so weeks with what's been going on with governments and central banks, the bond markets, the credit markets, and also with the Sandstorm Gold stock and Franco Nevada stock all in your space because there wasn't mine closures announced and your shares were selling off, they crashed. So what's your opinion of what's transpired in the last five or so weeks? Yeah, obviously a lot's been going on and, and a lot will continue to go on and things are changing rapidly, but um, <clears throat> you know what, what I think is, the obvious things that are happening is that there is a bit of, it's not a liquidity crisis yet, but I think people started to see a potential liquidity crisis coming from this and total demand destruction because of COVID-19 you know, for all sorts of industries, everything from commodities and oil and gas to just everyday goods. And as we all know, there was a massive sell-off in the stock markets and uh, margin calls all around the place and shares, including Sandstorm's, our share price went from $9 a share down to, and that's Canadian, down to about $4.50 a share. And so fortunately, we've got a really strong balance sheet. We started buying back our own shares. We bought back several million of our, of our shares. And uh, that, that liquidity crisis and margin calls, that phase has kind of subsided for now. I'm sure there's the average person out there still going to be getting margin calls, but the, the margin calls on mass have slowed down. Uh, gold companies are, are starting to do well again. Sandstorm share prices back up to $9. So I'm glad we bought those shares when they're at half that just a few weeks ago. But around the world, it's pretty interesting out there right now. I think one of the reasons we saw those fears of larger liquidity crisis abate is because of what the central banks are doing. Um, it, it's well understood that the Fed is doing a lot of quantitative easing for the first time in in the history of the world, they said they're willing to do unlimited amounts of quantitative easing. You know, they've they've already put well over a trillion dollars of liquidity into the marketplace, and they're continuing to do that on a daily basis. And so, right now, we're in a phase where people are going. The central banks say there will be liquidity, and we believe them. And I'm sitting here in Canada right now during this interview at my house, and for the first time in the history of our central bank, they're about to do massive amounts of quantitative easing to the tune of $200 billion, which is an e enormous amount for the Canadian Central Bank. Uh, and it's something that they've never done before. And they're willing to step into supporting not just and, and not just purchasing government securities, but they're supporting liquidity in a whole host of other ways. So, so that's the phase we're in where liquidity is being massively pumped into the system. The implications of that, obviously, currencies are going to eventually devalue. This eventually will catch up to us. And, and you put more money out there, the money is worth less. And it takes more and more money to buy the same amount of real assets. So the prices of real assets will, will go up eventually, being real estate, gold, other hard assets. But I think the phase that we have not felt yet is that because there has been fundamental destruction of demand and people are losing their jobs en masse at record levels, that this isn't just a liquidity crisis like 2009. This is a fundamental demand destruction crisis and, and there's fear in the hearts and minds of people. And I do not expect the economy to rebound quickly. And I think the damage that's going to be done to balance sheets of companies around the world Men, a number of companies will not survive. And I don't think that pain has been felt yet in the economy. I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Yeah, we have what the central banks are trying to do, counteracting the economic reality of the situation you just described. So the economic reality is there's enormous amounts of jobless claims here in the U.S. There's over 20 million Americans that just have filed for jobless claims in the last month. It's an insane number. I don't think we're done yet. 
and I'm sure it's that way in a lot of other countries as well. I could go on and on and on with the different data points, but I think what's really happening here is the central banks, this is end game. Just in the last two months, the Fed's official balance sheet is up almost $2 trillion, and that's just the official balance sheet. I interviewed Danielle DiMartino Booth last week, and she used to work at the Dallas Federal Reserve, and she said the real shenanigans is off balance sheet, where the Fed has 40 different bailout programs running behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and I think you know the Fed's going to do a lot of interesting things to try to prop up the economy, but but if you actually take a step back and you think about fundamentally what is happening here, so even before COVID-19 hit, I was on TV and various other programs saying the world has too much debt. We have record level of government debt relative to GDP in the world, record level worldwide of corporate debt relative to GDP, even if U.S. corporations were not at record levels. But and, and around the world, record level of personal debt relative to GDP. Just doesn't matter where you look, there's too much debt. And eventually that debt catches up with you. So fast forward, COVID-19 hits and total demand destruction, people are losing their jobs. So your debt serviceability and GDP are dropping precipitously right now. And so far, the solution that central banks and governments have is to provide liquidity by lending more money. So debt is going up at record paces when it was already at a record level and really not that serviceable. So, you know, the second rec reckoning for this is how do we solve the problem of there's just too much debt, it will not be able to be serviceable and our economy will not function properly with this level of debt unless there is a fundamental change to the equation. And I think that change to the equation is they have to devalue the currencies. They have to, because if they don't devalue the currencies and therefore make the debt easier to repay, the debt will never be repaid at personal levels, corporate levels, government levels. The, the whole world will be insolvent. So if th there literally is only one button they can push, and that's to devalue currencies, and that's what they're going to do. Yeah, I think everything that's gone on is completely and totally ridiculous right now. It's really tough to see any economic improvement. I haven't seen any single one. All the companies announcing earnings so far, it's all bad news. They've been trying to spin it. The analysts have been lowering the bars. But the one bright spot I would say is gold. So I'm confident now that the timeline for a $2,000 an ounce gold has moved up. Now, it, I would not be surprised if gold is over $2,000 an ounce in six months, but who knows what's going to happen with the gold price. But I'm just glad that I own physical precious metals. And then also um, everyone knows I have Sandstorm gold shares. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> well, you also disclosed this, Nolan, that you were buying other royalty and streaming company shares when everything crashed uh, briefly. Yeah, I think just owning um, owning royalty com companies is, is the best way to play the precious metals space, period. I think Sandstorm is, is the best one of those, but I'm biased, obviously. And I, when I have friends come and say, I want to get invested in gold i say here are five of the best streaming royalty companies in the world you know buy some with all five <laughs> and, and uh and hopefully sandstorm my job is to make sandstorm perform the best but i really do think it's the best way to play the gold space because you get diversification of assets you get diversification of countries we don't have operating costs so for example covid19 is shutting down mines all around the world they're being put on care and maintenance the mining companies have to spend millions of dollars a day a week a month to keep these mines ready to start back up, whereas Sandstorm doesn't have to pay any of those costs. We just sit here, we wait. When they start the mines up and running again, we're getting royalty checks again. And so we're just, every single year we've been cash flow positive. We've never had a cash flow negative year. We will never have a cash flow negative year. It's just not possible. So I wanna ask you about the state of the gold mining industry now. Let's start off with roughly a percentage of how many gold mines are shut down thanks to the coronavirus. Would you say it's about 30% give or take, or is it more or less? Yeah, I would say it got up to about 40% at one point. There are a few jurisdictions around the world now that are realizing that they need the income from mining and they, the people need the jobs. And so they've put mining on the essential services list where it previously wasn't. So places like Argentina, for example, um, the Quebec government, there are a lot of mines in Quebec and Canada, and they just put mining on the essential services list this week. And so those mines are all starting up as we speak. 
Very good. Yeah, I noticed that Sandstorm Gold had a number of key mines, including the Cerro Moro, which is Sandstorm's largest source of revenue, the Cerro Moro Silverstream, that's back online. Black Fox, uh, the gold stream from the Black Fox mine is back online. So Sandstorm is starting to get more assets back online. You disclosed in your annual general shareholders meeting, which was virtual yesterday, that what, around 75% of all the assets now are back online? Yeah, we've got about 75% of our production, we believe, back online. And the only major jurisdiction left for uh, that's material for us that needs to go back online is Mexico. And, you know, mining is really, really important to their economy. So I'm pretty sure they'll be turning that back on as soon as they can. Yeah. Also, speaking of essential businesses for gold mining, I was surprised to learn a couple weeks ago, I guess you learn something new every day, that in Nevada, gold mining is an essential business. So Relief Canyon, which will be Sandstorm Gold's newest gold stream, that will be online soon, right? Yes. Well, how soon? I was trying to get a little response out of you. Are we looking I, at Relief Canyon, Relief Canyon guidance? I just checked the website before I started recording this interview. It says end of second quarter, or do you think um, they're making better progress on that? I think, you know, I'm, I'm not up to it to speed on it on a daily basis, but in my experience, anytime you're starting up a new mine, you go through a period of sort of six to nine months of trying to figure out of what you just built, what are the parts that aren't working. And so I think they're in that phase right now. They have poured gold already. So they've got the majority of it built. They've got their leach pads built. They're, they are actively mining. And I think they're starting to put solution on the pad to pull the gold out of that rock. And our deliveries that they owe us are contractual and fixed once they pour gold. So starting in May, they have to start delivering us the contractual quantities of gold anyway. And uh, so I'm, I'm expecting in May to get our first payment of gold. Very good. That's what I was going to ask if you amended the contract with them, because from talking with Kim at Sandstorm Gold IR and also you over the years, that now these gold streaming contracts are very, very unique. You've adapted them now, whereas in the past, streaming contracts, excuse me, kicked in once commercial production started at the mine, but now you tailor them individually for each company's needs. Yeah, we do. We, we change the contracts to make sure that it's a combination of things to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the mining company so that it makes sense for them to do a transaction with us, but also to make sure that we're covering off our risk basis as we see the risk when we're doing due diligence. So for example, if we're doing diligence on a mine that's going to be heap leach, heap leach projects are notorious for uh, the leach curves taking a long time to kick in and the mining company is taking a long time to figure out exactly how to stack their leach pads and exactly how to leach it. And, and so it takes a lot longer for the gold to come out than they originally thought it would. So in those situations, we like to, in the first few years, have fixed deliveries to us as if the mine did work so that while they're figuring out how to make the mine work, we're not disadvantaged by that. Okay, very good. Now, I want to get your general overview of the gold mining industry as well, since we already talked about which mines are offline, the percentage. Um, what's your opinion since oil prices have crashed? It's been unbelievable. We were talking about this before we started recording. The demand destruction for gasoline, jet fuel, oil all over the globe, I don't think it's done yet. Are mining, gold mining companies that are actually running their mines now, are they benefiting extensively from this? They definitely are benefiting from this. Obviously, if you talk to a gold mining CEO today, he's not going to be super excited about low oil prices because he's still freaking out about COVID-19. But, but whenever oil prices go down, it, it generally is good for mining. And the degree to which it's good really depends on the nature of the mine. So for example, if you've got an underground gold mine that's got really high grade ore and the amount of oil that is used in the process of production as a percentage of your total cost is very, very low. Uh, those, those assets, you know, they are benefiting, but not really that much from lower oil prices. Where you really see the difference is in those huge open pits where they're mining very, very low grade ore and any incremental cost or decreasing cost of oil makes a big difference because your number one cost in those mines is literally driving the ore from that deep pit up to the mill to be processed. And so if oil prices go down, your costs go down a lot. So those, those are the types of operations benefiting. I've talked about that in articles from my Patreon account contributors with those enormous Caterpillar trucks because they have very low miles per gallon. They go through tires really quick. So they burn enormous amounts of fuel. Oh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, like a, a single truck can go through millions of dollars of fuel. It's, it is really incredible. And tires too. Yeah, the tires and the fuel, the, the costs are insane. Yeah. So with the gold price now, we're over $1,700 still. With the gold price and oil margin and the energy costs, I mean, margins should still, once the mines are back online in four weeks, six weeks, maybe two months, or 
whoever knows, the margins on paper should be very, very robust, maybe some of the best in the history of gold mining. Yeah, we are we're definitely getting into a period here where the gold price is running because there's an expectation of devaluation of currencies. And eventually, if there is a devaluation of currencies, that will catch up to the mining companies in the sense that cost of labor eventually will go up and cost of power will go up and all other input costs are going to go up. But now they haven't gone up yet, but the gold price has gone up. So I think you're exactly right. We could be into a phase of unprecedented margins for gold mining companies. Yeah, this is assuming that a lot of these gold mines do come back online because there's a lot of bottleneck problems in the gold supply chain with gold refiners being shut down, gold mines being shut down, and uh, the commodities exchanges are not getting all the physical gold they need. And then if someone tries to buy a one ounce gold coin, the premiums that some people are paying are nuts. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. If you follow the, like, the spot price of gold relative to the 30-day the future price, usually it's about a three to twelve dollar difference between the future price and the spot price the future price is always a little bit higher because there's uh, some contango in there but we're starting to see the the spread between the futures and the spot price be anywhere from 30 to 60 dollars an ounce and it can change 30 dollars an ounce in a day which i've been in gold mining business for two decades now and i've never i've never seen that it's basically what it is is people are paying a premium to get exposure to the futures because they cannot get the physical. Yeah. And the premiums at the coin dealer, when someone goes and buys a one ounce gold coin or even worse than that, I've heard stories from podcast listeners. One listener in Sweden emailed me saying that it was $250 an ounce premiums to buy an ounce gold coin compared to the spot price. This was that's, a week, this was a couple weeks ago though, I think. So I'm not sure what it is now, but a couple weeks ago it was that high. Yeah. Yeah. That's just crazy, but I, it doesn't surprise me. So you've talked in your interviews recently elsewhere in Kitco and other podcasts about the debt covenants for miners. Is this pervasive now where a lot of these mining companies have debt covenant breaches and the bankers are fine with things for now? And how serious could this get if this goes on for, I don't know, another two months, three months longer than that? Yeah, there, there are a number of companies out there that are going to be violating their debt covenants, some of which, you know, they're, the next time they report their covenants to their banks, they'll already be offside because... They, you know, a lot of businesses run pretty close to the line in terms of their debt covenants. And if you're a mining company and you have to shut off even one of your mines, that will throw you upside. And that's happening all around the industry. So uh, it's it's going to be a big issue. It's going to be something that all of the banks that lend to mining companies are going to face. Now, those banks are predominantly Canadian and European banks, not so much in the U.S., but uh, those banks are going to have a hard time working through through all of those challenges. I, and candidly, I, I think it's going to be case by case as to how it works out for those companies. Because, you know, for example, if you're a gold company that's just violated your debt covenants, but you go to your banker and you say, yeah, okay, I technically violated my debt covenants, except gold's at a record price. And I'm turning my mind back on next week. And six months from now, I'm going to be back on side my debt covenants. And within two years, I'll have my debt paid off if gold prices stay this high. The bankers are a lot more likely to say, that's fine, we'll waive the covenant. Versus if you're a, a copper mining company or a zinc mining company that's violated your debt covenants and the price of the commodity is so low, you go to your banker and have a conversation. The banker says, yeah, you're offside your debt covenants now because you had to shut your mind down. But even if you turn your mind on at these lower prices, you're still going to be offside your debt covenant. So we've got a problem. And, and that's usually when companies start getting ripped apart. Is this an environment where different mining companies, let's say a large mining company with a pretty decent balance sheet, they want to maybe fix their balance sheet a little bit, can do some emergency equity capital raises, let's say $100 million or less. Is this an environment where that can happen or that capital is not available? Well, I mean, there, the capital can be available. It's just whether or not you can get it at a reasonable cost. The streaming companies out there, Sandstorm included, are cashed up and we have lots of available capital to do deals with. And so I think you're going to see a lot of streaming companies like Sandstorm doing deals. We actually, it's kind of funny, we went to a base metal mining company well, about three weeks ago now saying, hey, you know, by our analysis, it looks like you're going to need money. Uh, do you want to do a stream? And said, no, no, we don't need money. That's fine. Anyway, they phoned us today and said, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you're going to see more of that in the industry. Yeah, the copper price when we're doing this interview again on Thursday, April 16th, is at $2.30 a pound. It got as low, almost down to 
below $2.10 a pound at one point at the end of March. It was $2.08 a pound on the chart that I'm looking at. So that's a price. I mean, I've, I've been covering this for my patron account contributors. Freeport McMoran, which is one of the lowest cost copper miners, needed about $2.60, $2.60 a pound, $2.70 a pound for substantial free cash flow. So these copper miners are cutting costs, but I would imagine that the balance sheets are in some peril and it's going to be tough to cut costs that much with how much copper has fallen. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think Freeport's one of those companies that theoretically is going to be offside their covenants too. Wow. And they have some really good assets. They have some of the best copper assets. They do. I want to ask you about financing for gold and silver miners and how it's changed. So you've talked about gold mining stock ETFs. When gold and silver were rising before they crashed earlier this year, about a month ago, were miners able to raise capital in November and December? Because I saw some capital raises. There was a new deal one, uh, excuse me, the new gold one. Well, I'm thinking about FDR. The new gold one that uh, had enormous problems for 150 million and the investment bankers got stuck holding the bag temporarily, what, for six weeks before they could get out at break even. So were gold and silver miners actually repairing their balance sheets throughout 2019? Uh, I would say on average they were. Uh, gold prices were high, so companies with operating mines, generally speaking, their balance sheets got better. Uh, the the companies that needed money, either because they're exploration and development companies or because you know they've got operating problems, capital continued to get harder and harder to find, and that's a, a theme that's been going on for years. And I don't know the solution to it, but but it is not easy to raise equity anymore for. Uh, for any mining companies, including gold companies. So financing is going to have to change. The industry has not figured out how yet. I think streaming and royalty finance like Sandstorm does will play a bigger part, but we cannot play all of the part. Um, we need equity to be available in our industry. So the bankers need to figure that out or the CEOs need to figure that out. Yeah, because it seems you were talking about the merchant banks and the private placements and the bot deals. A lot of those just dried up over the last four or five years. And a lot of that capital went into mining stock ETFs instead. Well, that's exactly right. And so our industry is very capital intensive. We need to raise large amounts of money to go build mines. And if we need to do an equity financing, it's you know, fantastic that ETFs and other passive funds might own 20 to 30 to 40 percent of your company, but when you're going to do a financing to raise the capital to build your mine, by the very nature of what those passive funds are, they are not allowed to write equity checks into financings. And so if a good portion of your shareholder base can't support you to give you the capital to go build your next mine, you know, where do you get it from? And that's the question the industry's industry is trying to understand and wrap their heads around right now. Is there capital available, say small amounts, say 500000 a million, $2 million for a junior who wants to do a drilling program, maybe restart it in a month or two when things are a little bit better to go raise that capital and start a drilling program right now, even with the gold price where they are, one would think without the coronavirus, with the gold prices where they are, that a junior should be able to go raise capital for drilling programs. But is that actually going to happen, do you think? Yeah, it's, it'll be more selective though. Um, for example, there's a group that Sandstorm um, subleases some space to that what they do is they find really good assets and good management teams, put them together, uh, float the companies publicly, raise them some capital and, and get the exploration companies going. They're very, very selective about the quality of management teams they work with and very, very selective about the quality of assets they associate themselves with. And they built up a reputation that you know, if they phone someone and say, hey, we put this new deal together, here's the story, do you want to write an equity check into it? Um, they're very, very successful at getting people to write those checks because they, they have such a good track record. And so just in the last year alone, they've raised multi-million dollar financings for, I believe it's three separate companies. And, uh, and I think they will be able to continue to do that. But again, it'll be selective. There's a lot of smaller companies out there that want to raise a million dollars for the next drill campaign, but they don't know who the people are that write checks. They don't have a good reputation as a management team and they're not going to get the money. And candidly, they probably shouldn't get the money. Our industry has been widely criticized for wasting money unnecessarily by junior explorer companies that are not looking after shareholders' best interests. And I think that is getting washed out of our industry. I think that's a good thing. So yes, the answer is small amounts of money are still available for good management teams and good groups that know how to add value.
do you think a lot of your shareholders like when you go and write a check for a million dollars for a private placement and then you get some equity in the junior and then you also get a royalty are are those positively received or most or most like institutional investors they don't really care about that that much uh, i think it's positively received but i would say positively received with the appropriate amount of enthusiasm for them in the sense that they, they're not really going to move the needle on an individual deal basis for Sandstorm. But when, you know, we buy, uh, you know, in a year, if we buy 10 royalties and our average cost of buying those royalties is almost nothing because all we effectively did was just buy equity in the company to get $1 royalties or $10 royalties. Um, you know, those add up over time and eventually Sandstorm will have hundreds and hundreds and eventually hopefully a thousand royalties if if I don't dream too big. And that will move the needle and, and add value for ba basically no cost for our shareholders. So people like it. I like it. But it's, you know, it's currently not driving the majority of the value of Sandstorm. Yeah, I totally agree. Sandstorm is valued on its cash flows. Absolutely. So my listeners would love an update on Hot Modern and Agua Rica. You were supposed to get feasibility studies out for those in 2020. Or have you heard if there's any delays or are those going to be released sometime in the next couple quarters? Yeah, so Agua Rica, my understanding is Humana is working on that. I don't stay too close to that. Um, they'll, they'll notify us when, when that study is out. Uh, that transaction there is... For those of people who are, are not familiar, we have the right to buy a gold stream for 25% of their, their gold production for a specific amount, but we don't have to make that decision until the mine's 25% constructed. So we don't really care when the feasibility study comes out. We'll start getting excited when they actually start building the mine. Uh, the, the more imminent one for us that I'm really excited about is Hodmod, and that's the one in Turkey. And uh, it's probably our most substantial asset. They are completing a feasibility study. Now I was talking with Lydia Made in Chillick's management team. They're the guys that are building the mine about a week ago. And for COVID-19, they have shut down activities at site for two months. But the majority of the work on the feasibility study that they're doing can be done from their desks that they, they actually have done, done the drilling and done the metallurgical test work that they're basically just sitting at desks writing reports right now for the feasibility study. The, the only thing that has not been completed is a little bit more of the geotech drilling. So they'll have to wait till COVID-19 blows over to get that done. But so I, I expect the feasibility study to be slightly delayed, but not that much delayed. And I think the target for around the end of the year is is still what we're shooting for. With the guidance for Hotmon, and so you still expect then that there's not going to be any major delays for Hotmon as of now? Well, I think COVID-19 is, is going to push everything, the whole world back. I mean, nothing is going to escape <laughs> being delayed by COVID-19. Uh, hard modern included, but uh, I, I'm not seeing anything that would delay it other than COVID-19. So it's it's still a full steam ahead project. Yeah, COVID-19 shut down well cared maintenance for Fruta del Norte in Ecuador. I really like that mine. I think it's got a lot of exploration upside. I think that was a really shrewd royalty acquisition that you did. Yeah, we uh, we like it too. <laughs> Has any exploration drilling happened before the mine was shut down? Do you know? Uh, my understanding is that they had allocated uh, many millions of dollars to exploration drilling and had started started that program. I don't know how far they got with it. They're a big company, so they don't release drill hole by drill hole like a junior mining company would. So I think the answer is yes, they've started, but I'm not quite sure how far along that they are. So let's talk about the Sandstorm Gold balance sheet and your goals for the next 12 months to wrap up this interview. So Sandstorm Gold, there was a Seeking Alpha article writer who was criticizing your balance sheet, but Sandstorm Gold has a lot of warrant money coming in, but it's $50 million by the end of the month. So it's substantial. And you disclosed in the annual general shareholders meeting, uh, the transcripts that came out yesterday, that that's going to pay off all your debt, right? Yeah. So we've got about net debt of $30 million right now. And that warrant money is, coming in I think, next week, all of it, and it's $50 million US. So we'll have 20 million, we'll have no debt. We'll be entirely debt free and we'll have $20 million of cash in the bank next week. Very good. So it's good to have cash in this environment, isn't it? Absolutely. And and more more than just having cash, we, we still have a lot of positive cash flow and we have a $300 million undrawn revolving line of credit. And we do, and using that to go grow and acquire more streams and more royalties. 
Did you think companies like yourself, Franco Nevada, do you think the opportunities are going to be with the copper miners in? Because it sounds like the copper miners are in distress, but if the due diligence process on some of these deals is not right, these byproduct streams for gold and silver for on the copper miners, they could go bad pretty quickly. Yeah, I think the opportunities are going to be with the copper miners, but there will be also a lot of copper miners that reach out to streaming companies asking for stream financing and will say no because they're their cost of production is too high or the balance sheet is too far gone. Um, you know, our business is get associated with good quality companies and good quality mines. And, and uh, our competitors view it the same way we do with respect to that. So we're not going to save all copper companies at any cost. It'll just be the ones that are, are worthy of it. Yeah. Franco Nevada thinks the same thing as you because they just did, just did a shelf offering for 2 billion. So it looks like they're looking at the same things that you are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I really enjoyed our discussion today, Nolan. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so if our listeners want to learn more about Sandstorm Gold, you have a lot of research on the website. You also have the asset handbook that goes through details about the cash flowing assets and the juniors. How did they do so? Yeah, you can just go to our website. It's sandstormgold.com, and it's got a a huge amount of, of resources that people can not just learn about Sandstorm, but just learn about our industry and how royalties work and how royalty financings work. And, and if you're someone who has never invested in a royalty company before, there's a lot of information there to help you understand what it is. Yeah. To summarize everything, this is a big time cash flow business, diversified cash flow, low overhead. So that's what most people don't understand. And you guys don't mind. You mostly just collect checks and then you look for growth to reinvest for more cash flow. Or if the stock crashes, like what happened a month ago, you buy back your shares with free cash flow. And in the future, hopefully we will be getting dividends. Exactly. And very few companies, Nolan, have the, the cash flow and the free cash flow to do all of those things or the flexibility to do that. And we could see with Franco Nevada that they do have the flexibility to do that. So hopefully Sandstorm Gold is up there on the levels of Franco Nevada someday. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm very happy as a Sandstorm Gold shareholder. So I was buying, I was buying when there was blood in the streets um, in 2015 when all those articles on Seeking Alpha were talking about that you guys were going bankrupt. Yeah, that's not possible with a streaming company, but uh, I love the pessimism that happens when, when everyone's panicking. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you.